champion of visions, global trend generator, pioneering promoter, mentor of many iconic organizations, lighthouse of international leaders, encyclopedia of ideas with the courage and the ability to implement them in record time. This are not 12 people, this is one person, and this is our today's ECS STEM stalwart, Professor Dr. Moritz von Ruyen. Hello and welcome from Nikita Dehia. Let's understand, let's understand why I say this. This Dutch economic historian and geographer is the recipient of the very prestigious European Association for International Education, the EAIE, Constance Meldrum Award for Vision and Leadership. EAIE is the largest international higher education event of its kind in Europe, and the conference is hosted in a different European city each year, barring, of course, COVID. He's also the recipient of the insignia de Hoyro of the Universidad Santiago de Compostela, Spain. Professor Dr. Moritz has been the rector magnificus and the CEO of Nijmegen Business University, the Netherlands. Since 2012, he's been the elected CEO and the rector of the London School of Business and Finance. Since 2013, he has been unanimously elected academic CEO of the Global University Systems, GUS, as it's popularly known. It's huge and it's large. And he's also the acting rector of Gizma Business School in Germany. In addition to all of these roles, Professor Moritz is also the rector of University of Applied Sciences, Europe. Welcome. Professor Moritz Faruyan to this ECS 10 uh, series with stalwarts. A very, very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Can I make a small correction, a tiny correction on, on your introduction, which sure. was really undeserved and, and much too generous. Uh, but actually, we have a rector nowadays at Gizma, so I'm no longer acting rector. Uh, Gizma is a, is a well-known business school set up at Gerhard Schröder in Germany, which is part of global university system. And Professor Stefan Stein is now the rector. I'm the chairman of the board of uh, Gizma. Uh, it's a minor, erect, it, it, you know, minor, minor correction, but uh, I, um, I think it's, uh, it will be a bit unfair for Stefan Stein to be suddenly <laughs> be told that I'm still the acting rector. So that's why. Thank you for correction, but it's still so many roles, so many positions and so many hats that you wear. And so I'm aware that we all have 24 hours and so do you. How do you manage all these roles? So many positions, do you allocate like one hour for each position or role or? No. <clears throat> so first of all, I, I, I really enjoy doing different roles at the same time. Um, things can sometimes be a little bit slow in academia and doing different roles at the same time allows you to be still quite active and productive while things take the time to work through the process and procedures, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's one reason why I've always enjoyed doing different roles, but also I, I like to be busy. Uh, but most importantly, uh, being able to do those roles uh, at the same time, and there are actually more than you, you mentioned, I will not bore you with all of them. Uh, because I also roles outside GUS, which we might want to talk a little bit about, and 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 of course also some other roles in GUS. Doing all that is 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 possible because you surround yourself by good people. And uh, whatever I do in my life, I always ask myself, who are the right people I want to work with? And obviously, you're absolutely right. There are only seven days in a week and only twenty four hours in a day, um, but. When you surround yourself with really, really good people uh, with complementary character and, and, and enthusiasm and so on, uh, you can do actually a lot. And, and I learned that uh, when I was still you know, relatively junior staff member at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam. Um, we're going back now maybe 30, 35 years. And I had the opportunity to build up a center and I suddenly realized by attracting really good people 
I could be so much more productive by trusting these people, by letting them get on with it, almost liberating them, uh, keeping it coordinated, of course, but, but creating a team spirit. Wow, you can do suddenly so much. And that's a lesson I've take, kept with me for my entire life. You can do a lot at the same time, but always make sure you find the very best people you can find to work with. And, and uh, you know, in that sense, I've been privileged that at Gus, we got some really good people. And, uh, and that's really what enables me to be very efficient with my time. You have mentioned about an entire mm. book on leadership. <laughs> it's, it is so enlightening to uh, interact with you. Um, there are always challenging times and uh, certain things can be a little challenging. Which position has been the most challenging so far for you and what kind of challenge? Um, Look, I mean, the, 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 the challenge is good. Uh, people sometimes feel challenge is bad, but challenge is actually good. So um, <clears throat> when there are difficult circumstances, you don't focus on the difficult, but you focus on the opportunity. I know that sounds like a cliche, but for me, every uh, complication, every challenge and so on, uh, also comes with, with its opportunities to achieve things you probably would not be able to achieve without that challenge. So obviously at the moment with COVID-19 uh, going around, uh, wow, that's very challenging for a lot of institutions, but many institutions and many institutional leaders would recognize that actually it has also been uh, maybe not a blessing in disguise, that is a too big word, but certainly has created new opportunities to do things we would not have been able to do, or certainly would not have been able to do so fast without that particular crisis. So for me, uh, challenges are, are something you can draw energy from. You, you have to look at the opportunities, not get fixated on the problems. Uh, and then actually, I, I think challenging jobs, yes, is, is great. So we do different things also at Global University Systems. I mean, it's a system of universities which we, we manage and own. Um, and some of these institutions are great and, and we support the management that they grow. And some, especially when they join us in the early stage, they, they need work because they have some problems and they join us because they have some, some, some challenges, right? Uh, and, and we actually often say, yes, that's great, because it also opens up real opportunities for us uh, to, to put those institutions, you know, in a, in a reformed way on, the, on a new direction sometimes, uh, create new energy in those institutions and, and let them flourish. And that's very rewarding. So for me, challenge, it, yes, can be stressful, but actually for me, challenge is more the equivalent of in the end of the day, getting rewards because you see new opportunities, etc. So it's actually a positive story for me. Very rightly said. I mean, uh, it's the same at ECS too, and COVID brought in challenges. And um, with that help, actually looking at opportunities, we are able to grow and reach much more, penetrate into um, uh, deeper layers of the audiences um, and students. And I think it's been very rewarding, very rightly said so. Professor Moritz, you've been, you have taught by invitation, of course, at several universities worldwide. So from University of Pennsylvania, Cambridge University to the University of Hull, um, University College London, Bergen University, Norway to Leibniz and Hanover, Germany. Vienna University of Technology, you've been a professor at Guangdong University, Beijing Union University, Victoria University, Australia, and of course, the Nine Road of Business University in the Netherlands. You've traveled the world uh, by teaching and extending and giving a part of yourself. What has that experience been like and where do you think are the best students? So first of all, uh, there's nothing as, as, as rewarding as teaching, to be honest. I mean, I obviously don't do a huge amount of teaching anymore in my job, but I still enjoy every time, whether it's virtual nowadays or, or whether it's in person, uh, to interact with students and to, and to do teaching. And, and, and the reason why I find it so much fun and why so, I find it so rewarding is because for me, I do not define teaching as teaching. 
I define teaching much more as learning. Uh, so I, I come and even though, you know, I'm obviously sharing some ideas and so on with, with the students and, and, and talk about my experience or whatever the subject is or my ideas and, and, and insight and, and uh, you know, depending on what, the, what is the, 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 the theme of the, uh, the, the lecture. Uh, the bit which I enjoy most is the discussion. The discussion and the questions. And the bit which I really enjoy is when students or the audience ask a question which I have never thought of before. Uh, a really difficult question, I might not even know the answer of that question. And it, it forces me to think, or it might force me to rethink and think, was I really right there? Was, or maybe I, I missed something. And, and this is what I find so rewarding. When you teach, it gives you a learning opportunity. And learning is, is absolutely crucial in your life. Uh, learning is the opportunity to develop, to grow and deepen your insights, uh, to, to learn also from, from your actions and so on and the impact of your action, but especially also with lecturing. People challenge you, and that is positive. And, and so for me, teaching is the, the equals of, of a learning opportunity. And I do exactly, by the way, the same in my, my working life. You know, I've been sometimes uh, wondering, you know, why do I enjoy my work so much? Uh, sure, I like to help people. I like to have impact on, on the life of, of people, young people or less young people, it doesn't matter. But what you do, what, in, I enjoy most is the fact that uh, when I say something, people might challenge me. It forces me to think things through deeper. And all the time, I'm learning. I'm learning from what works. I'm learning what doesn't work, which is even more interesting. Mm -hmm. Why didn't it work? Why didn't it go exactly as I thought it would work? And that learning is, is really what gives me great satisfaction. I mean, this is... This is uh, I, I, people say sometimes, when will I stop working? And I would say, my definition would be, stop working when you don't learn anything anymore. As long as you develop, as long as you learn, it's exciting work. When, it, when you don't feel that you're learning anything, you're just replicating, you're just doing what you have been doing many times before, put yourself a question mark and say, is this really worthwhile? Or should I maybe do something else? For some people it's satisfying, don't get me wrong. I'm not making a judgment here. But people like myself, uh, honestly, if you don't learn, you should not work. So true and so humbly put up. And uh, this is so well understood uh, where there are very young people by age, but they would have <laughs> matured a lot through mind and vice versa. And <laughs> you're, 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 you're challenging um, you're wanting to exploit the best out of yourself for the benefit of the student community and for the people around you. You're always striving to give uh, more. One of the things that's really observed is that you have expanded into various fields and sectors with equal force. Um, you have clubbed fields, blended fields, a unique stalwart. You know, you're talking about agribusiness. Uh, you talk of history, geography, but also business and economics. What, uh, why do you think are these blended fields so vital as compared to the traditional thought process of just progressing in A field or B field? So, and what combination makes it successful? Yeah. <laughs> So the, the world needs both. The world needs specialists and the world needs people uh, to be broader. But uh, we also know that if people are really, really just specialists, uh, they have a problem sometimes to interact with the rest of the world. And they don't, they, they, they don't always see the context of the, what they're trying to, to work on. Um, so yes, whether it's T-shape or X-shape education and so on, this is really what ultimately makes people more effective in their work. So I'm, I'm not saying we need zero experts. Of course you need experts, but um, give you an example, um, the current COVID situation, right? Is that really just a medical problem? Mm -hmm. uh, can you solve COVID by being a doctor and, 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 and vaccinate people and that's it? 
Uh, it has proven to be a much more complicated problem. It, it has its economic implications, political implications, right? It, it, it cultural implications, social implications, social mental health implications. Uh, so there's a, suddenly so many other aspects which are just as crucial to understand what COVID is about, you know, and also in terms of, of statistics and, you know, it's a perfect way to illustrate how complex these problems are in the modern world. And you cannot solve them with just one discipline. So it's very difficult for one specialist to step forward and say, I'll solve it, right? And this is true, obviously, for COVID, but it's also true for, let's say, environmental issues. It's also true for, for urban development, which is my academic field. You know, you cannot address urban development with just a discipline. You cannot address it just as an architect or just as a, as a social scientist or just as an economist, etc. So it, it needs to come together. Now, of course, uh, what you do is, is everybody has their own specialization and you create the teams of people to work together. But it's very difficult to work together if you have not any understanding about you know, the discipline and the background of others. Right? So for me, strength really comes from diversity, but in order to unleash that strength, you need to have people who actually appreciate that diversity and actually understand why someone is maybe coming from a different angle and, and why that is actually an, an, a, a, an, an, a valid angle. So this is where the, the, the more T-shaped education, interdisciplinary education uh, comes from. And that is, uh, yes, obviously we need specialists, but specialists who understand the context of what they uh, work in because a single person cannot solve the big issues we have to solve. And, and, and that's, that's very much of my, my uh, philosophy has always been bring disciplines together, make sure that people look beyond uh, their own discipline. And, and by the way, there's an, an, a second aspect, and that is um, it's not only about the academic disciplines, it's also about you personally. Uh, so uh, if you want to get a job, great a university career, a, a university, sorry, degree is, is very useful and in many cases, even essential. <clears throat> but that only gets you a job. It gets you an entry ticket, right? But in order to be successful in that job, you need more than a university degree. You also then need to have the social skills, the empathy, you know, to be able to work with people with very different backgrounds. You need to understand that, you know, what it actually means to work with people, right? It's easily said, but actually it's very complicated as we all know. And, and your success is actually very heavily determined by what you manage to do once you're inside that company. Can you use those skills, et cetera? And I, I'm a great believer that uh, uh, students when they study <clears throat> also have opportunities to look broader, to get some hard skills like uh, digital skills and so on, but also uh, the soft skills, uh, which aren't soft at all. They're absolutely essential for future career success. So this is what uh, uh, I, I believe why education should be broader. And this is also why I'm a passionate believer in, in things like experiential learning, mm -hmm. right? So you've got the formal learning, the classroom learning, etc. But actually in order to develop to the next level and to develop those those. Uh, skills you need in order to be successful, which you can't really get from a, a manual. You can't just read a book and now you know everything you need to know about how to manage people or something like that or how to lead. Uh, you really have to do that the hard way. Uh, and that is going out in the real world, experiential learning. And I feel that all degree programs should have a real high proportion of experiential learning because when you're a student, you still have that safety net. You can still make the mistakes. You can still learn how to reflect on what didn't go well uh, before you actually go out in the real world. Uh, so you're much better prepared uh, for that, that uh, success, whether it is as a, as, a, as, a, as a professional, as a manager, as an entrepreneur, as a politician or whatever uh, direction you want to choose. Yeah. Yeah, it is said to learn swimming. Uh, you cannot with a manual, but you need to dive uh, into a pool. But, you know, yeah, yeah. But, but the nice thing of doing that in a university context is that when you yeah. dive into that pool, yeah. it's not whether you are able to swim or sink.
there will be actually people there to to help you to protect you and uh, and and that's really why experiential learning in in study time is is so important there yeah. and and this is also as i said uh, we we try to introduce it wherever we can in our own institutions at global university systems uh, but it's also something I, I passionately do, again, at global level uh, through an organization, which I'm co-chairman of, is the World Association for Cooperative Education, Cooperative and Experiential Learning, I should say, right? So this is cooperative education is one form of experiential learning, uh, which is all over the world. It just has offices and, 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 and clubs all over the world, but the secretariat is now based at the University of Waterloo in uh, Canada. Uh, but we've really been working for decades to promote, to go beyond the formal learning in the classroom, right? Uh, you, you, you know, be beyond the, the classroom, beyond the laboratories, go into the real world and learn from that as well. You've touched upon many, many vital topics of 360 degree learning, organic learning, which is uh, substantiated mm -hmm. with a, a thorough foundation and cooperative learning. And in my association um, with Germany, German universities, and also European universities, since over 20 years, uh, public universities do hold a lot of prominence and dominance. And uh, GUS, the global university systems, uh, comes with a full force. It's the privately owned, probably the first privately owned and operated institution, but it's now grown to be so huge with 25 institutions, 42 international locations, 75 plus thousand students worldwide, and so many partnerships. How, uh, what are your thoughts that goes behind making GUS so successful in a world where private universities have their own dominance and prominence? Yeah. So, <clears throat> and are the, the, people accepting of private universities? So it's it's kind of an interrelated. So the reason why we are private is because we are global, right? Um, so the, 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 when we uh, created a global university system, it's the first university system, like you've got the university systems in America as well. Um, it's the first university system which is, is truly global. So the idea, uh, uh, Aaron Ettinger, the entrepreneur, and myself uh, had was uh, university systems is something which is very successful in many ways in America, but it's always national. The world is globalizing. The world needs people who can work and operate global. We need to think global. Uh, we don't need to think about just the university. We're doing a bit more international work. We have to think from a global perspective and then look at the university. So how could we have a university system which is truly global, right? I always say, uh, you know, we higher education is not immune for of globalization, but shouldn't be want to be immune. We should lead it because there are also negative aspects of globalization. And higher education has a role to stimulate the positive aspects of globalization, right? And and control those negative and actually move globalization much more as a, as a positive force. So it's very important to have a university system at a global level, which actually really thinks global. Now, of course, there is no national funding institution at a global level. Uh, so by definition, you can only create a university system at a global level by operating in the private sector. And by operating in the private sector, we have the benefit of having access to funding. Uh, we have the benefit of really working across the borders and, and, and really practice what we are preaching. And that is, is, is really higher education at a global level through all the institutions which are part of global university system. So yes, we are in the private sector, but we are in the private sector for a purpose because what we do could not be done in the public sector. So this is a real added value to the higher education uh, landscape. Now, of course, uh, some people might be skeptical about private education on an ideological ground. I still maintain that what we do is not possible in a, in a, in a, in a state funded, the taxpayers funded 
system. But uh, the other thing is, uh, when you look at the higher education in the world and the top universities, actually the majority and, and many of the leading institutions are private, right? Uh, they, the private sector universities are actually just as common and certainly as prominent, if not even more prominent than, than the public ones. I mean, Harvard and Yale and so on are private institutions, they are not public institutions. So there is a role for public universities and there's a role for private universities. I'm not against public universities mm -hmm. at all. And most of my life I've been in public universities. So I have absolutely nothing against that. And I think they, they have a very powerful role to play, mm -hmm. but there's also a role for private universities. And there's certainly when it comes to global education, a role to be played for, for, uh, for private sector. And uh, are we accepted? Yes, I mean, the students accept us, employers accept us. Of course, there will be people who politically will not accept us because they have another ideological view on what education should be. And for them, it's either something which can only be neutral when it's 100% state funded, or uh, in some cases that it needs to be state controlled, which I'll definitely find a negative uh, aspect of, of uh, state funding. Uh, but I, I, I fully appreciate that, uh, you know, I'm not saying we should spend less money on uh, from from taxpayers on universities. On the contrary, I uh, would say it's uh, very, very important to uh, to really get also public funding and to fund our fundamental research and so on in uh, in all over the world. Right? It's a very beautiful. Um perspective and an understanding because um, there are no geographical boundaries anymore. The world is one and we are looking at things with an international perspective. We would like to know from you, what are those key aspects that are over and above what the public universities offer so is it better professors um, global teaching with international professors or is there more university uh, industry partnership or higher internships or what sets GUS apart what is what are those key elements and with yeah. what mindset um, is that implemented so so first of all um, you know I, I, I don't see it in those terms of competition uh, you know, it's horses for courses. So you've got very good universities, which are really research-led uh, and, and, and are being recognized as research-led universities. We are not research-led universities. Uh, it's not our aim to produce a next Nobel Prize winner. We are about professional educations. We are about giving people a platform for their career. So it, it's always very important to, to bear in mind that we don't get carried away by, by things like rankings. And so on. you've got institutions for very good in their own mission, and you should look at that in the context of their mission. Our mission is professional education. We want students to come and study with us and then get a reward in a, in a successful career, right? So we are very much focused on, on that aspect of education, which by the way, is what the big majority, probably 98% of the students really are looking for, right? And there's nothing wrong with the other two or 3%, on the contrary, but that's what we are focusing on. And, and of course, as universities in, in, in our sector, uh, we are paid for, first of all, by tuition of students. And therefore, uh, we are very much focused on the students. We are not paid for by taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So we are not focused on taxpayers. We are not focused so much on you know, what the ministry is willing to give us. We are not focused on the political lobby. Uh, you know, we are actually paid for by our own students. And therefore, our focus is completely on our own for students. Uh, that's really, you know, where we need to demonstrate the success of, of their studies with us. That's where we need to demonstrate that they get jobs afterwards and so on. So that's really where we are primarily focused on. And then, of course, as I just said, because we also know that they need to get jobs afterwards and so on. Uh, the other very important stakeholder for us are employers. So uh, working closely with employers is, is absolutely uh, crucial. Uh, you mentioned earlier already the the the, uh, the importance of things like internships and so on, and you mentioned the the uh, the German education in that context. Right, German education has a great track record when it comes to professional education and making sure that there's a close connection between universities 
and, uh, and, 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 and employers. And, you know, our own institutions, mainly because they are with the public sector, are very much focused on sitting down with uh, uh, companies, listening what they need, what kind of graduates mm -hmm. do they need, what kind of talent are they looking for, mm -hmm. but also how can we work uh, close together in making sure that our students already experience some of that world of work uh, mm -hmm. before they graduate. And this is what I said earlier, the importance of experiential learning. So to be concrete, um, the role of things like duale learning, which in, in Germany, you got the famous system of what they call duale learning, also the, the, the duale students, sorry, which is really where you have a job and a study at the same time. So your employer pays your studies, et cetera, whilst you're studying. Uh, and, and this works very closely together, which is a wonderful system, which I think should be really adopted uh, globally. And, and we definitely would want to promote that more uh, in, in the global university system. But also uh, in our studies um, at the undergraduate level, students have the opportunity uh, in the fifth uh, semester to either go abroad as part of globalization or to do an internship, which is supervised, which is accredited and so on. And we now also building that into our master degrees. So even at master level, we recognize the importance of students actually doing a project with a company. And, and so we're creating that opportunity as well. So that interaction is very important. And of course, the other thing is the professors. So in Germany, uh, to use that example, uh, very simple rule, uh, unless a professor has several years of really real hands-on experience, in, in the, the sector of which they are teach, about which they are teaching, uh, we would not appoint them as a professor. So they might have their doctorate and they might have even published and so on, unless they come with that practical experience, we would not appoint them. And that makes us very different from, from uh, traditional universities where you can uh, study, you publish, you do your, your doctorate and you publish more and then you become professor and you, you might have never left the campus. Right, uh, that's impossible in our, our setup. We really want our professors to understand about the sector they are teaching about so that they can really talk to students about the real world as well as the more conceptual type of, of, of what they need to learn. And also bring real life solutions and not textbook solutions to the real life problems what the students are asking yeah. and posing yeah. and you also highlighted on the academia industry partnerships and i've seen that gus has a very good um, partnership with uh, companies like kpmg adidas and more so how much of focus um, is really given to develop uh, the academia industry partnership or is it just a part of it part of the whole learning no, no, it's, 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 it's very much at the heart of, of, of what we do. <clears throat> Let me give you an, an example that's always easier than just talking about the high level. Uh, so um, University of Europe for Applied Sciences in Germany uh, launched uh, a few months ago a new campus in Potsdam, just outside Berlin. Mm -hmm. We call that an innovation hub. And, um, and this is where we, we teach things which are in the triangle of business, design, and technology. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's a very innovative concept. And we do that in close collaboration and in close discussion with companies, because we know that's what companies actually enjoy. They don't necessarily want people to just be great designers, very creative, but they actually do not understand the technology behind it. And they cannot think in terms of, of okay, Hey, I have to work in a commercial environment here. I have to think in, in terms of business as well. But also they don't just want people who understand business and, and marketing and so on without actually understanding things like the products and, and the technology behind it and so on. So they really want graduates in, 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 in this field. So we created this innovation hub, which brings those disciplines together. And then we, we work closely with uh, companies and, and listen all the time, but talk with them about, you know, is this really exactly what they want and, and what kind of companies do we talk with well, we're talking with companies like ibm we're talking with uh, companies like tesla of course they're building that big uh, european uh, factory yes. there they are so hungry for talented people mm -hmm. right who actually are able to think 
outside the discipline and actually bring things together. And, and, and so the interaction with understanding what companies want, not just now, but also what they want in, in, the, in the future, mm -hmm. right, uh, is, is really important given our mission of creating a launch platform for, for our students, for our graduates. This is very exciting because we are, we, uh, for students, we never talk of right now. It's always talked about eventually, a couple of years down the line, because uh, that's when they're going to be graduating and working, uh, getting into the workforce to understand. So if they don't understand the, the mindset behind the company, the degree is not going to matter. What a profound thought. In your vast experience, what you think is really vital? Is it knowledge? Is it imagination? Is it the grit to succeed in your field or the passion for your field? <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, so, first of all, I, I think um, character is, is very important. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and when I say character, there are two aspects of character. One is your openness to work with other people, uh, to be respectful to other people and, and reach out to other people. Second one is uh, how to deal with setbacks. Uh, nothing ever goes smoothly and you need to be able to cope all the time with the setbacks. And if you work in a team and you want to be a team leader, then it's also how do you actually keep the team motivated even those things might not always go exactly to 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 plan so character in that sense is 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 probably the number one two and three uh, mindset and and that also means a little bit introspection i don't want to sound too too soft or something like that but uh, you do need to be comfortable with yourself so some people are sometimes nervous about oh i'm not very good at this or oh, i'm not very good at that i'm not very creative right and, and, and in my job, I need to be creative. So now, you know, I better try to look creative, right? Um, you don't need to be. And this is why I said, uh, uh, when you come up with this long list of all the things you need to have, actually, you don't need to be perfect. Uh, what you need to do is find other people who can do what you are not very good at. And, and be comfortable with that. So be comfortable also with your imperfections, not just, I mean, appreciate what you're good at. You, know, you don't need to be false modesty all the time. I mean, I'm sure everybody is good at quite a few things and you should not be as shy of that, but you don't need to talk about it all the time. But also uh, very importantly, the fact that you're not perfect is not actually making you less effective in, in your job or your role or as a human being. And, and this is what people often uh, forget. So it, when it comes to character, it's about this feeling at ease with yourself will help other people to also become more at ease with yourself and you can help other people. And helping other people makes a success story, which in the end of the day becomes your success story. Uh, so this is something which is, is often difficult for people to appreciate. They think they are successful because other people are less successful. And, and, you know, when they, they start working with the elbows and trying to play office politics and so on, you know what the truth is, you are more successful because you help other people to become more successful as well. And then together you become more successful and you get appreciated and you will get more responsibility and you become more and more successful in, in your life. And, and this is, I think, is the, the absolutely crucial point. Uh, you know, the, the, the character, your empathy, understanding other people uh you know i can look at at uh, uh, nikita and i can see the person who is interviewing me right so your role is to interview me and i can also look at nikita and i see a person who might have actually a whole story behind them so obviously we're not going to do that on air but normally i would like to know more about nikita i would actually want to know why are you doing this? What are you trying to say? What, you know, what, what actually is your passion? What triggers you, et cetera? Because I'm sure then the interview would be even better, right? We had not, not an opportunity to do that in this case, but that's what I normally would do. Uh, even when I speak in public at, uh, for an audience, very often I like to 
really interact with an audience, try to get an understand an audience, get to understand some of the people in the audience. Uh, they're human beings, right? They're not an audience, they're human beings. And uh, so that understanding that people are not just a role, but they are people. You know, mm -hmm. the people, the person behind the reception is a person and you want to understand what person that is, et cetera. That helps you then also to help the reception being a better receptionist, but actually it helps you ultimately even in your work, right? Uh, because you actually learn a lot from a receptionist about what's happening in an organization, believe me. Uh, I do the same with students. So when I, whenever campus I am and so on, I like to talk with students. Just say, hey, how are you? Who are you? What you're doing here? But also then ask maybe a few other questions just to get a feel of that person. But it also tells me a lot about what's actually really happening, which often all the statistics I get, all the prints out and so on, all the you know, things I can see on my screen actually will not be able to tell me. And uh, so, Yes, it's it's a very good question, and and you know, ultimately the most important thing is you as a person, your character. How respectful are you to other people? How much do you appreciate other people, or how much do you think other people are a threat to you? How much are you in conflict with other people instead of actually recognizing that most people are actually by the large wanting to do the right thing and actually want to work with you. That's really the, the, the key thing. You understand all the colors of the rainbow and the entire gamut behind it. And you've also interviewed key decision makers that shape the organizations and the many organizations that you're associated with. What is that one thing, just that one thing that you look for in that person over and above, of course, the required education and the position demanded skill sets, if you had to put your finger to one thing, what would that be? I think the, the, the if it has to be one thing, uh, mm -hmm. it's not an easy question, I must admit, because you normally uh, look at what people have to offer and then see how they would fit in what you need. So it's, it's always about matching rather than, than just saying, you mm -hmm. know, this is what I want to see in every candidate. But probably uh, one thing I, I like to see in candidates is, is a certain curiosity, mm -hmm. uh, wanting to learn, right? So if candidates come and they, during the interview, they basically almost give you a lecture because they already know everything, it's, that puts me off, right? So I like to, to, uh, to work with people who do not pretend to be the best, but they, they, they're eager to learn. And, uh, and, and that's really what you probably is the most important thing is, is people who uh, are <clears throat> desperately seeing this as an opportunity to grow, uh, to new, learn new things and so on. So they might not be the most experienced person for the job. I've made quite a few appointments of people uh, who were less experienced than other people who applied, but they had that attitude of, this is exciting, Mm -hmm. I think this, I can do this, but you know I, I'm, I'm not sure about this or that, but you know I'm, I'm, I'm happy to give it a try and, uh, and I think I will learn a lot from this and so on. This is kind of attitude which, which makes it a, a pleasure working with people. Uh, enthusiasm and, and curiosity and, and eager to develop. Yeah. So wonderful. The um, ECS audience comprises of uh, not just students and researchers, but also a lot of um, decision makers or um, flag bearers of certain organizations, vital organizations, and they would all be looking up to you in this interview. What is your esteemed advice to them for their uh, fruitful career or giving back or What's your advice? I think the, 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 the main thing uh, you can do in, in, in your role, in a senior role, is, is to support the people who work with you mm -hmm. and to uh, make sure they feel comfortable in their role. Uh, to challenge them, sure. We, of course, part of your job is to challenge people all the time and to kind of push them further. But um, they should not be living in fear. 
-hmm. You know, sometimes you have leadership styles which are very overbearing and people just try to feel, well, oh, if you make a mistake, cover it up. Hopefully the boss will not find out and so on. That's a very uh, uh, negative working environment. So you need to make sure that people feel comfortable with you. And, um, you know, uh, there is an, an, an aspect and it's also a problem in, in education whereby we punish uh, failure instead of actually recognizing that failure is part of the learning process and failure is not a negative thing. Uh, you know, we, if we don't fail, we are not trying. And, and that's also true in work. Right. So I'll, I'll give you a small anecdote. Many, many years ago, I did quite a lot of work for, for a Dutch company, uh, Shell, uh, mm -hmm. Shell uh, uh, Oil Company. And, and I, I, you know, I worked on the PR side. But nevertheless, at a certain moment, I, I met the, you know, the big boss of Shell, you know, the, the CEO of Shell. And we had a conversation. I said, I'm, I'm so impressed with the, the people you know, at your top level, because I've met quite a few. And, and wow, these are really, you know, powerful people and so on. And he said, it's, you know, it's, it's simple. In my organization, the people in my senior team, if they sit there and after a year, they haven't had to confess yet that they made a wrong decision, they made a mistake, they failed in something, I remove them from the board. I expect my people to, to come clean and say, I messed something up. And if they don't mess anything up, they have the wrong attitude because they're not trying. Mm. Because you cannot be 100% successful all the time. So in a company like that, you need people to occasionally say, okay, I tried it. I thought it was the right thing to do. It turned out to be the wrong thing. Why did it, was it the wrong thing? Well, I learned the following from it and, and I will not make that mistake again. And, and that is kind of reassuring to, to you know, and, and uh, the, the top person that, um, that, that people are really committed and passionate and try as hard as they can and they occasionally meet the minute. Now, of course, if someone has to do that every meeting and say, oh, I messed up again, then you should get worried as well. But, uh, but it is a very powerful message because if you look at it, so many organizations, people make a career because they don't make mistakes, right? So the, 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 they get promoted because they never make, they never do something wrong. And, and in public organizations, that's often the way people are expected to make a, an, a career. In the for-profit sector, in the entrepreneurial side of the world, it's actually not something you can afford, right? Uh, so we need to create an atmosphere where occasionally we get it wrong. Uh, the same in education uh, with the regulatory framework. You know, if regulatory frameworks are there to create an, a risk avoidance amongst institution, to make sure they do everything right, and they never do anything wrong, actually you will not get any innovation in higher education anymore. And I've kept many discussions with, with regulatory organizations, agencies, saying be careful, uh, don't punish the fact that institutions occasionally got it wrong. Only punish when institutions try to cover up, because that you do not want. But if institutions say, okay, we tried something innovative, it didn't work out completely, and sorry, and we learned from that, that's actually very, very important. Then you've got a healthy educational sector, which is developing, which is innovative, where new things are happening. And, and uh, so it's even on that front, you, you need to create that, that comfort that people actually can take some risks, be open about it, and also be open about it when, when it didn't work out the way it worked out, should have worked out. Such wonderful pieces of pearl, and I'm sure uh, the audience would like to string it together and shine out with the radiance that you've shared. Professor Moritz, the last question. You have been everywhere, I must say, for lack of a better word. I mean, in organizations, in institutions, universities, you have seen much ahead of normal things and you have not just generated, but also promoted and implemented to a great extent. What does the road ahead look like for you? I will continue what, what challenging What is that you myself. wish to achieve? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I, what I want 
to achieve is, is uh, first of all, at the personal level, I want to continue challenging myself. I will always be open to doing new things, which uh, pushes me out of my comfort zone. So as I said before, uh, if you feel you're too much in your comfort zone, you're just doing what you know, and you're repeating all the tricks you have done before, it's actually uh, becoming uncomfortable uh, for me at the personal level. On the higher level, of course, what you try to do is, is have a positive impact in, in, in the world. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's really what drives you when you go into education or go into academia, right? You're not doing this for yourself. You're doing this for other people. You're doing this because there are so many young people you can actually help in their career paths. There are so many problems in the world, which hopefully, not me personally, but through uh, my colleagues, through our professors, um, but also through our students, through our graduates and so on, we can help to contribute to, to do something positive. And ultimately, I'm a great believer in globalization. I think it's absolutely true. There are a lot of nasty aspects of globalization as well. And I do not believe in unregulated globalization. But I do believe that globalization can actually help to address some of the issues we have in this world. Uh, we need to be careful with the negatives. And, 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 and as I said, I'm, I'm not anti-regulation. I'm not like a liberal market and let everybody just do whatever they want to do. But um, globalization can also make this world actually better and, and actually help us to, uh, to really uh, develop you know, positive solutions. And that's really what I hope to contribute to. So thank you for that. If I can do that, thank you also for getting that message across, uh, uh, Niketa, because it's an important message, right? It's not just about getting rich. Actually, that's the least important aspect yeah. of life. Uh, yeah. It's about what can you actually contribute to the world? Yeah. The poorest are the one who only have money. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, it is uh, so profound that you're actually talking about the tip of the Maslow's theory um, of self act through self actualization and using the position to benefit the society in large to contribute uh, and to create a legacy. Thank you very much for your very very profound inputs throughout the interview through the various aspects that you have shared in terms of the thought process or in terms of um, um, you know a regulation that a university can pick up and it's it's been uh, very nice uh, during this interview i thank you and i appreciate your time and inputs it was thank a pleasure you. it was a pleasure thank you professor moritz and audience if you have any questions of course professor moritz and his whole team is always there to answer and we are also here to answer and you can reach out to us at queries at the rate exponentconsultants.com queries at the rate exponentconsultants.com make sure you write a complete nice email so if it is for professor moritz we would love to send it to him he travels worldwide but he has a network of executives and associates that are strategically located in most important locations of the world and they make sure that the message reaches him. So thank you. It's a thank you very much for having me here. And, and you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm always open for any queries, any questions uh, through you, through the social media like LinkedIn and so on. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always there uh, for if you know, obviously, I appreciate it. I cannot always quickly answer myself, but uh, I'll definitely uh, will see the questions coming in. And uh, thank you very much for creating that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Moritz.